Hello and welcome back to my channel. My last video about my side quest to build perfect fingertips received a tremendous amount of your participation in the comment section. There were a lot of comments that brought up some solid points and possibilities, while others, such as, have you thought about making interchangeable fingertips specific to different activities, means I probably should take a moment and introduce myself, maybe give a little backstory for the new viewers. My name is Ian Davis, and a little over five years ago, I lost my fingers as a complication from low bone density and a bone infection after spending most of a year at UAMS in Little Rock, Arkansas, where I was there receiving high-dose chemotherapy and later an autologous stem cell transplant as treatment for multiple myeloma, a terminal form of blood cancer. I am currently six years post-transplant, and after being told by my insurance carrier that fingers are considered a luxury, I've been on a mission to design and develop a mechanical partial hand prosthetic device that can be distributed in a DIY kit format without most of the customary medical markup. For everyone else that already knew all that, thanks for watching and welcome back. So, a good place to probably start this video is by talking about some of the more frequent comments from the previous video. There were quite a few people that mentioned the possibility of using leather for the fingertips, and you'd think that leather would be a solid, viable solution. After all, it is cured and processed skin. But my experience working in a shop environment, it doesn't take very long for leather to pick up and absorb grease, oil, and dirt. Even after going the route of treating it with conditioner and beeswax to try to keep it somewhat clean and protected. Once conditioned leather absorbs water or oil, it tends to get really slippery, and the much needed coefficient of friction is dramatically decreased. So, a million years ago, I tried using the palm of a leather welding glove as the foundation to build the socket portion of one of my early devices. What I found was it took just about zero time sweating into it for it to just turn nasty and gross. And once it did, I was never really able to get it all that clean again. Of course, one of the most obvious issues when dealing with leather is it doesn't heal. It took about two seconds right up until you actually start using it, and then it would show every little abrasion or scratch. Of course, that's not the only issue. You still need to figure out a way to get the leather to reliably stick to the metal tang of the finger. Something that's really important and should be considered when selecting a material and process for this type of thing is since the fingertips should really be considered consumables, I need whatever I'm making them out of to be something that I can produce without getting a pile of labor and material into. So in the end, leather with its cost and labor intensive requirement is kind of a not as awesome solution. I saw a bunch of other comments talking about the overmold process that I've demonstrated several times in earlier videos. That's the process where I take a 3D printed piece that snaps onto the metal tang of the finger, then use two parts silicone to cast the shape of the outer profile. This works pretty well for a while, but then I run into the issue where the silicone itself doesn't actually bond to the core. During normal use, it'll stretch, and then all of a sudden, I find that I've dropped one or multiple fingertips somewhere on the floor. Most of the time when this happens, I don't realize that I've lost the outers soon enough that I'm able to find them and pocket them. If I do manage to find them, I can usually super glue them back into place, and depending upon what I'm doing that week, that'll usually hold for a couple days, maybe more, but eventually they'll rip or just fall off again. I think for overmolding to become more successful in this use case, you need to have something integral to the core to make for a more solid mechanical attachment. Something along the lines of slots or holes that are built into the fins that are on the sides of the core. This would allow the silicon to flow through the holes and bond back to itself. The idea of the holes mechanically works okay, but in the end, I wound up with an issue of the scale of the outer dimension of the fingertips just getting a bit out of proportion. It was either that, or the sides of the fingertips became too thin. From my experience, anything less than about 60 thousandths of thickness makes for a fingertips that's lifespan just isn't what it needs to be for the amount of effort that goes into making them. And it doesn't really seem to matter what type of silicone you use, either. I've had the same not-so-awesome result with thin cross-sections, whether I'm using Silplat 20, 40, or 60. And of course, the next natural step in this line of thought would be to be making the entire fingertip out of silicone. 
Although now you get a whole new issue. By the time you get it rigid enough to hold firmly onto the tang to where it doesn't rotate or pop off during normal use, the rest of the body becomes too firm and doesn't compress when you're trying to pick something up. This led me to abandon the thought of trying to cast the fingertips and explore the idea of printing them using flexible resin, burying the infill in order to get the difference in density. All of the area around the distal tang would be printed at 100%. And as I move towards the outside profile, the density would drop to say 20%. Unfortunately, so far in actual practice, they don't hold up as well as you'd think they would. And I briefly experimented with a hybrid of the previous two ideas by printing a core with attached grid and lattice work to flexible resin, and then attempted to overmold them with Lumilite Silplat 20. Unfortunately, this amazing idea came with an issue of chemical incompatibility. After thoroughly washing and curing the resin framework, there was something about the flexible resin's chemistry that wouldn't allow the silicone to properly cure. I've tried this experiment a couple times, each time winding up with a perpetually gooey mess. These setbacks lead me to think that FFF might hold the solution for me. I've had pretty good luck printing the fingertips in TPU. Currently, I'm using some off-brand 80 durometer filament from Amazon. I'm using the gyroid infill pattern. It gives me pretty decent stability and rebound, but the prints are still just a bit too firm. It's not perfect, but it is what I've been running for the past couple of weeks. I also saw quite a few mentions about using ColorFab VariaSure TPU. That's the material that if you print it at 190 degrees C, it behaves similar to 95A TPU, but if you print it closer to say 250, you end up with a product that's really squishy and similar to the foam used in your tennis shoes. I've had pretty good luck experimenting with it so far. The durability seems to be okay right off the printer, although at higher temperatures, it is a bit stringy. I've tried to mitigate this stringy by running the program using different fan speeds, anywhere from 20% all the way up to 100%. It does clean up pretty okay with a knife, but if you were to make a whole sheet of them, cleanup would become a pretty tedious process. The only other issue that I have with the color fab is it gets dirty really easy. I bet you can guess which one of the fingertips on my hand is printed in color fab. Now, a process that I've recently become really excited about trying involves printing the fingertips using a Prusa XL. Prusa's new large format machine that swaps filaments by using a tool changer setup rather than by retracting the filament in and out of a single extruder and swapping it that way. Of course, the big downfall with any of the single extruder MMS systems currently on the market is it's recommended that you stay away from trying to print any of the flexible filaments through them. And I don't know if you've actually ever seen just how flexible color fab filament is, but there is no way that you'd be able to run it through a system that pushes and pulls the filament in and out of a single extruder. So my plan is to use the Prusa XL to print the color fab material at different temperatures, hopefully giving me different densities. What I would do is load three of the extruders with the color fab filament and set extruder one at 190 degrees, extruder two at 220, and extruder three somewhere around 250. Now, the cool thing about this idea is rather than switching materials, you'd be switching extrusion temperatures. And since you're using the same material in all three extruders, you should get a print that varies in squish without any of the delamination issues. Chemically, it is all the same material, so bonding shouldn't be an issue. The print will be set up so that you print everything close to the tang with extruder one. All of the area that's between the inner and the outer, you treat as a transition zone and print with extruder two. And everything that becomes the tactile surface with extruder three. This should, in theory, give you the best of all worlds. And if I can manage to get the stringing issue under control, I should be able to make full sheets of fingertips without labor and post-processing becoming too much of a concern. Thanks again for all the comments and suggestions you guys have been leaving me. If you have any other great ideas or materials or processes that you think I should try out, be sure to leave them in the comments section. Thanks for watching.